Thank you, Diane. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the conference today. I had a chance to meet Ken Green uh, this past March at the Philadelphia Flower Show where I was able to hear him talk passionately about his work with the Hudson Valley Seed Library. Uh, Ken is co-founder of the Hudson S uh, Valley Seed Library, uh, a regional uh, uh, upstate New York uh, organization that's devoted to uh, uh, developing regional seeds. He's gone from being a librarian to, to, to who started the, the seed library to uh, obviously a gardener, seed saver, farmer, entrepreneur. Um, Ken, I'm going to be really short here. Um, Ken is a rising star in the seed movement. So please welcome him to Heritage Farm. Good morning. Um, it's, I can't really tell you what it feels like to be here for me. Um, I've always, always wanted to come to Seed Savers Exchange and never really been able to figure out how to make the trip happen. And to have John invite us out here uh, to share our work with you is a huge honor. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here. So thank you all for coming. And this is also, the, you're kind of guinea pigs today, I'm sorry to say. Um, I've been giving uh, talks for years now. And I started finding that I was um, getting a little tired of my talk. <laughs> of doing the same talk again and again, even though I believed in everything I was saying. And also, things have changed so much for us with the Seed Library. Uh, and so this is a, a new talk that I'm working on, which is all about uh, art and the intersection of arts and agriculture, which is a part of the Seed Library that has really developed over the last few years um, and led us in new directions. And so I wanted to share that a little bit with with you all and hopefully have something new to share with you um, that's a little bit of a different perspective on seed saving and uh, community seed saving movement. So uh, if you want to learn more about the seed library and what we're doing with the seed library, I am going to be giving a talk on Sunday which will focus more on how do we get started and where are we at now, and the seed library movement across the country, if you'd like to learn more about that. So this idea of heirlooms, uh, it's not really something new, even though it has a new meaning in terms of where we're at as seed savers uh, at this point in history. But this is an advertisement that I wanted to share with you. Uh, it says, your grandmother's garden. This ad is from 1901. So it's really interesting to look back historically and see that people were thinking about what their grandmothers were growing and the importance of what their grandmothers were growing long before we were thinking about it today. Uh, and there's a quote here that says, there's nothing new except what has been forgotten, which is Marie Antoinette. And in, in many ways, that's how I feel about the heirloom movement in general and thinking about seeds, that we're remembering a lot of things uh, and trying to bring them back into existence. Um, but this ad represents something else for me, which is when I started the seed library uh, and was adding seeds to the library catalog at our public library, people were asking me, you know, why, why is this important? Why should we care about these older varieties? We have new and improved varieties. You know, we're always saying, we're always seeing, you know, this is better, this new thing is better. Why should we look back at these older varieties? Why are they so important? And I found myself having difficulty sometimes really communicating to people, why are these seeds so important? Why is this concept so important? Um, and this, this ad has sort of come to represent that for me a little bit. So for me, uh, a lot of the beginnings of the seed library was about books. Um, I, do you have a, is there a nice library here in Decorah? I think we park next to the library here in Decorah. Um, the library I was working at is tiny, two rooms, um, itsy bitsy library. Thank God we had interlibrary loan. And I could totally abuse the interlibrary loan system. I was ordering books all the time, anything to do with seeds, 
sustainable agriculture, genetic engineering, just learning. And there are certain quotes that really inspired me. This is one of them from uh, Gary Nabon. When pooled together, these microcosms of life called germplasm contain more information than contained in the Library of Congress. And to me, that was sort of mind-blowing to think that seeds contain that much information. And, and I, I started thinking about these connections between seeds and books and seeds and libraries. And another one is from Jonathan Driori, who runs the Millennium Seed Bank. And he says, all life depends on plants. Damn it, even the books here are made out of plants. <laughs> and that was another one of those moments where I was like, OK, there's connections here. Um, seeds are more than just our food. There's many parts of our lives that are dependent on seeds. And so the quote that really inspired, in many ways, the seed library and led us to where we are is an even older quote from Cicero. And Cicero said, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. And I wholeheartedly believe that. And this is just sort of some of my ideas in the beginning about relationships between uh, seeds and books. So seeds can go extinct. If we're not saving them and sharing them, they can disappear forever. And books go out of print. And what libraries do is they keep those books in circulation. So even though that book is out of print, we can sh still share it with each other. Uh, so there was one relationship. I think of seeds as having different types of stories, genetic stories. And I think in a library, when we're thinking about books, we're really thinking about nonfiction. There's a relationship between a genetic story and a nonfiction book. Then there's history, as we're all very familiar with here through Seed Savers Exchange, the history of thinking about where did these seeds come from in those stories. Then there's myths and tales and all kinds of tall tales that come with seeds as well that have a fictional quality to them um, but are really important to the seed stories. Uh, and I also think about, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, and by the same turn, don't judge a seed by its pod. There's a lot we can't tell about a seed um, just by looking at it. Um, and so one of the things that this relationship between print matter and seeds led me to was to start a collection of antique seed catalogs. Uh, as a librarian, um, primary documentation was very important to me. And so I wanted to start collecting these seed catalogs, mostly out of an interest of how many seed companies were there 100 years ago? Where were those seed companies? What were the varieties that they were being offered? And can I find those varieties still in existence through Seed Savers Exchange Yearbook or other types of seed exchanges? I was focusing mostly at that time on uh, seed catalogs for New York State. Uh, uh, and this was the first catalog that I bought. So this is a Fairview S Seed Company, 1914 seed catalog, Syracuse, New York. And uh, one of the things that I noticed that I hadn't thought about, because I was really thinking about it as on, on a sort of research scale, was the artwork. And I was really struck by these catalogs um, the beauty of the artwork. The covers are always incredible. And then every single page, you see artwork from all different artists put together, creating this wonderful seed catalog that communicates about the seeds that are in there in a way that feels very different to me than modern catalogs. So I started also doing more reading about art and thinking about this intersection of arts and agriculture and arts and gardening. And this is a quote from Paul Cezanne. And he said, the day is coming when a single carrot, freshly observed, will set off a revolution. And he wasn't necessarily talking about gardening. <laughs> um, he was really talking about art. But there was this, there, this moment with a quote like this when I really thought, this is a, this is a time in history right now when the way that we perceive seeds, the way that we think about seeds, the way that we treat seeds and honor seeds is incredibly important. And that if we want to have a seed revolution, if we really want to change the way the seed industry works right now in terms of loss of genetic diversity, consolidation of seed resources, genetic engineering, we have to learn how to see differently than the way we've been treated 
treat, uh, trained to see. And those old catalogs really showed me that art is a very powerful tool for helping people change the way that they think about something that they're looking at. And so this, this is a really amazing illustration of a painting. It's, it's a Magritte, if you couldn't tell. Um, it's sort of it, very quintessential Magritte. And it's called The Explanation. And so for me, I love this, this work because it's this, it is looking at carrots in a very odd, fresh way. And what is it an explanation of? <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, <laughs> but <laughs> to me, it's, this, it's another one of those moments where, oh, you're looking at carrots in a different way here. And next to it is uh, a close-up of the cover of one of our seed packs with uh, artist illustration that was made for us for our Kaleidoscope Carrot Mix. And she also came up with a very unique way of thinking about looking at carrots and the very many colorful carrots that are out there, even though we think of carrots mostly, especially growing up, as orange. And to find out that there's all these other colored carrots is, is an eye-opener. Um, this is another quote. <laughs> uh, Gardening is the art that uses flowers and plants as paint and the soil and sky as canvas. Um, I think that's pretty evident, especially with Diane's garden right here. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the painting of the gentleman there who's made out of vegetables, it looks very contemporary. Um, it's very odd and interesting painting. Uh, and it's from the 16th century. Um, it's a, a really fascinating guy named Giuseppe Arcimboldo. And to look back that long ago and see someone really looking at this, you know, we are what we eat. We are the plants um, that are part of our lives. And he did all of these portraits uh, of well-known and famous people of that period, uh, recreating them out of uh, different materials. Next to that is an artist who created a piece for us uh, for Dragon's Tongue Bean. Um, who had a very fanciful way of interpreting that name. And heirlooms come with all these wonderful, fascinating, uh, imaginative names. And so that was his way of representing the dragon's tongue bean. So I had been really focused on this relationship of seeds and books, and I was starting to be more interested in the relationship between seeds and art. And Sir Walter Scott said, nothing is more the child of art than a garden. And what I like about that quote is I think we often can see um, how uh, gardens inspire art. You know, a lot of people will paint flowers or paint these beautiful garden or agricultural scenes. And yet there's this back and forth relationship, really, in which art also inspires gardening. And so this relationship between seeds and art, and to me, one of the things that's really important about the community seed saving movement and an organization like Seed Savers Exchange is recognizing the mark of the hand and the importance of the hand in saving seeds and passing seeds between people and from generation to generation. And that's something that's very important to me about art as well, that there's always the mark of the hand. There's always an individual. There's always a person involved in creating that story and passing it on. Um, there's skills that people need to learn, whether you want to be a seed saver or an artist, that have to be passed on from person to person. There's also all of these individual ideas of what is beautiful. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, whether you're looking at a work of art or if you are deciding which of those tomatoes is your idea of the most beautiful tomato that you want to save seeds from and pass on to the next generation of that plant. Taste is also very individual, uh, whether it's taste in art or tasting a food and deciding that that's a food that's worth se saving seeds from to pass on. Diversity, evolution, process, all of these things are relationships where you see uh, these are important concepts both in seed saving and in art. And ultimately, I think what they have in common is about telling a story. And I think that's part of what 
has really been forgotten about seeds um, is this idea that it's not just a commodity. It's not just something that we can weigh and put a price on and put on the market uh, for profit, that seeds come with stories. And so how can we really communicate these stories and the importance of these stories uh, in a new way um, by looking back at the way it was done a long time ago? And I really think art is an important part of telling that story. So I used to have a real chip on my shoulder about hybrids. Um, I used to talk smack about hybrids a lot. <laughs> um, I've learned a lot in the last eight years that we've been doing this. Uh, and I've really changed my tune in terms of, I don't want to talk about seeds as good and bad or good and evil. What I want to do is look at seeds and their stories. Every seed has a story. So you can see here, you know, whether we're calling it an heirloom, a hybrid, open pollinated, or genetically engineered. Those are different ways that we can talk about seeds. And what they really are is different stories. And what I started saying to myself when I was gardening is, which of these stories do I want to grow? When you're growing a seed, when you're planting it, and it's starting to grow, that plant is the expression of its story, of its history, of the tales. Uh, and so what kinds of stories inspire you? What kind of stories do you want to grow in your garden? So Hank's Extra Special Baking Bean, one of the first family heirlooms that was donated to our seed library, comes with this great story involving Flossie and Hank and all of these people in Ghent, New York, growing things, coming together, making baked beans. What's the perfect baked bean? Um, I'll talk a lot more about that story at, at when I do my workshop. Uh, Sun Gold Cherry Tomatoes. Of all of the hybrids, when people are like, I'm mostly growing heirlooms, but... <laughs> the, the butt is usually followed by sun gold cherry tomato. <laughs> I'm still growing that. E and, and the interesting thing about the sun gold cherry tomato is now there's all these stories of this person's trying to create an open pollinated version of sun gold. This person's trying to untangle uh, the hybrid. And so there's all these myths and legends sprouting up about um, who's going to create the first stabilized sun gold so that everyone who loves sun golds can grow an open pollinated variety version of it. Uh, there's open pollinated stories. Uh, I don't think that just because we're interested in heirlooms, it doesn't mean that uh, if something's not technically called an heirloom, not that there's much technicality to thinking about what an heirloom is, but open pollinator varieties are very valuable and important, including new open pollinator varieties that are being developed by folks like Frank Morton. And then the last picture, genetically engineered seeds. Um, I kind of love the name of this <laughs> variety. Um, Genuity Registered Smart Stacks TM 20455SS. <laughs> That name tells a story all by itself <laughs> uh, of the history of what did, this, th what did this genetically engineered seed go through, what hands, what corporations did it go through to become what it is today. Um, but if I took away all the words here and that Roundup Ready corn sign and you just saw the photos of these varieties, you would not know the difference between the stories you wouldn't know what story you were going to grow in your garden. The names don't really tell you that much. Uh, and unless you did some research, you wouldn't know. So one of the things that I started asking is, well, how are we telling these stories? Who's telling the stories and who's receiving the stories and how are they being communicated? So that top line there, uh, how are these stories being told over the past 200 years, shows a series of images from uh, antique seed catalogs. The middle part, who's growing today's seed stories and creating seed culture, shows some logos, which are also artwork, uh, from different organizations and corporations. So you see Seed Savers Exchange, Hudson Valley Seed Library, Native Seed Search, um, uh, Vandana Shiva's organization in India, and does anyone know what that last logo is? Who that is? Okay, yeah, I won't say it out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, and then 
the last part there says art of the heirloom, keeping the culture and agriculture. And those are that's just a little snippet of some of our seed packages with the original artwork on them that we commission. So this going back to the catalogs, this was the first catalog. Um, and what happened was uh, my collection started growing kind of rapidly. I, I developed a pretty severe eBay habit. <laughs> um, you can set up an alert on eBay. <laughs> and it'll send you an email when something you're potentially interested in comes up. So I had to stop doing that, although it's, it's my birthday, and Doug got me a gift certificate to eBay. <laughs> <laughs> So I might be adding some new catalogs to the collection. And I also started collecting other types of seed ephemera, so seed packages, seed advertising, um, to really get a bigger picture uh, of what was going on. This is one of the earlier catalogs that I have, uh, Joseph Breckinson's 1895, Boston, Massachusetts. Beautiful illustration of an nasturtium, uh, and a wonderful description that went with it as well. And one of the f earliest references that I found to using testimonials. And testimonials are think something I think of more as like for infomercials. Um, but it's been going on for a long time. It's another way of telling a story. Uh, so this testimonial said, a beautiful sunset is not more varied or brilliant in color than are your nasturtiums. I was very interested in this illustration. It showed a mounding nasturtium instead of a trailing one, which is a little bit unusual variegated leaves, different color flowers. Uh, so it really stood out to me. Also, in terms of the uh, beauty of the illustration itself, and what I really started to think of, uh, the illustrations in these old catalogs, I call it botanical expressionism. So it's like botanical illustration in a way, but a lot of these artists took a lot of artistic license with what they were doing as well, and I was very interested in that. Uh, this is F.B. Mills, 1911, Rose Hill, New York. Uh, really started uh, seeing more color in the catalogs around this time period. And what was also interesting, with, along with the graphic design, is the renaming of things. Mills is one of the most useless catalogs for research <laughs> because almost everything that they got, whether it came from a family or from a commercial source, they renamed Mills such and such. And, of course, when Mills no longer was Mills Seed Company, no other seed company was going to keep the Mills name on things. And so sometimes doing research is difficult. And so this is all in chronological order. And what I started uh, finding, what was interesting to me, was that I could see the seed story start to change over time as I looked at my collection in chronological order. So here we have 1930, and this is a uh, totally different way of thinking about gardening right here. It's all about the view from the house and the beauty. We're leaving behind those uh, scientific type illustrations that we're really focusing on the vegetables and thinking more about the home. Uh, exaggeration, hyperbole, <laughs> became a big part of uh, how seed catalogs needed to market. This is the best, the biggest, the earliest, the tallest. Uh, and artists were part of perpetuating these exaggerations. Um, monster zinnias, I haven't found zinnias this tall <laughs> yet. If you find them, I mean, she could be very short. It's true. <laughs> it's true. And artists were also part of introducing new varieties that became the heirlooms of today. This was the introduction of King of the North Pepper, 1934. Awesome, big, blocky red bell pepper that ripens in a short amount of time. Uh, so great for us in the Northeast, great for folks here as well. We always get an incredible crop of peppers from this King of the North Pepper within this season that we have to grow big, blocky red peppers. And you'll also notice that um, this is a colored photograph. Um, it's still very artistic looking. Photographs started coming m more common in sea catalogs, uh, 1910, uh, 1920, although there were plates um, and photographs before that. But the golden age, what's considered the golden age of these historic sea catalogs is the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that's when it was all illustration. And I think that's interesting that that's considered the golden age when there were all of these artists involved. 
This is our King of the North. Um, this is showing uh, 1934, this catalog, Harris's Seeds, same catalog as the King of the North, uh, all, all photography, all black and white. And to me, looking at it, it's not as engaging and uh, not as interesting as the illustrated catalogs. But probably for people looking at this catalog, this felt very modern. And this was another way, a new way of telling seed stories, which was by taking all of these uh, still life type photographs. This is a banana melon. Uh, 1930, uh, you start seeing more again more pictures of homes, hand colored photographs. All of that changes in the early 40s with the war. So here's an artist trying to find a way of communicating the grittiness of the time period, the extreme importance of growing food. So the cover of this catalog is this very earthy, we are planting food. It's all about us, our labor, planting and making sure that we can feed the people in our country. Uh, and the inside of the cover, a photograph of stocking up. So another way an artist is finding a way to communicate what is the most important story of seeds for this time right now. Uh, also, this was um, this a really interesting page where it says new, which is all about hybrid corn, and very old, which is all about soybeans. So the beginning of the discovery of soybeans um, as a potential crop, and they actually predict in this catalog that soy will become one of the most important food crops uh, in the, in the world, and it, it was an accurate prediction. 60s, uh, marketing changes a little bit again. And here we have shorter skirts, pretty girl, another way of telling a seed story, communicating to people, um, and trying to get them interested in seeds. It's also the first catalog where I ever found a reference to government. Um, and if you've watched some of the documentaries about Monsanto, um, and you see this revolving door between lobbyists, government officials, and employees of Monsanto. This has been going on for a long time. It's nothing new. This is actually a photograph of Governor Dewey, Albany, New York, at a Robson Seed Company meeting. Um, as seed companies got bigger and seed consolidation started happening, it was even happening in the 60s, it was even happening in the 40s, uh, government and corporations started becoming more and more intertwined. Seeds are the foundation of food, and that's a very important thing for governments to be in control of, maybe not for corporations to be in control of. Um, and then this is where we were 2008. This is a map, uh, if you're not familiar with, this is an incredible website to go to. Phil Howard, professor at MSU, does all these different uh, food and other related maps. Um, it's another way of visually representing a seed story. This shows who in 2008 was in control of the most seed resources on the planet. The biggest red circle there being Monsanto, the next one being DuPont. So things have changed a little bit uh, since then, but not too much. Um, and so here we are back to that last uh, logo that you were looking at. Uh, Monsanto's logo used to be that giant red M um, with the Monsanto, very like, we're going to stomp on everything kind of looking <laughs> um, logo. They used art to rebrand themselves. They realized that they had an image problem. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> And so they chose this very handmade looking wood block print to start trying to change the story of what their seeds were about. And all of these are different uh, Monsanto or other uh, GMO related uh, advertising using artwork. The, the one I call the Mal Marlboro Man campaign. <laughs> um, this is real farming. Uh, the Now What, which is We Need to Feed the World, that's a $250,000 ad on the back page of New Yorker magazine. Not a farming magazine, not an agricultural publication, The New Yorker. Um, and then this is my the one I call Schoolhouse Rock. Do you guys remember Schoolhouse Rock? Um, so Schoolhouse Rock, the GMO application process. You know, it's very funny and, and easy and... Uh, 
cute, even though we know it doesn't really work that way. And artists started playing a very important role in the pushback um, and finding other ways to visually represent what is Monsanto really about? What is genetic engineering really about? Um, so I love that Terminator corn seed pack with and when I start getting too, too um, buried in thinking about the overwhelming issues of genetic engineering and, and Monsanto and our government, um, I, this is my happy place slide <laughs> that I go back to. Uh, these are trading cards from uh, seed companies. Um, the first one shows a bike race. What are they winning? They're winning seeds. I think everyone should want to work that hard <laughs> to win seats. It's a great prize. The, the bottom one is called the Return from the Insect Parade, and I love the idea of a vegetable parade. Uh, this one is, is a trading card. It says, everybody likes radishes, don't they, Charlie? <laughs> and uh, we, we ran our own um, caption contest with this, and the caption that won our caption contest was, a little thought bubble coming out of the guy that says, I wonder if she knows her roots are showing. <laughs> so this slide is uh, an image of an oil painting um, that was done for us. What, what we've done is I really believe in the arts and the power of the arts to help us tell our story of why seeds are important now and to get people who maybe aren't thinking about seeds, who aren't thinking about gardening, to pay attention and to think a little bit more about why are seeds so important, why do we need to celebrate seeds, honor seeds. And so that's why we started uh, commissioning artwork. And so for each new variety that we introduce each year, um, we find an artist to illustrate it in some way. I'm always looking for artists with different mediums because I want the artwork to represent and reflect the importance of the diversity of the seeds we're offering. So it's not one artist doing everything. It's not one photographer doing everything. It's all different mediums and all different artists. This is a painting that was done for Laxton Shell Pea. Um, and this, the original to this is upstairs in the barn. Uh, and you can get to see that. And uh, this, I think this painting is a really good example of what art can do. When people see this seed pack, um, they stop and they look at it. They might laugh, they might see it as beautiful, it might trigger a memory. Whatever it does for them, it gets them to stop for a moment and think twice about that seed pack and to see seeds in a new way. Why do we have the artwork with this? What is this trying to communicate? Um, and also, why would a seed company go to these lengths to commission artwork for their packs rather than just taking a picture of the pea and putting it on the pack like everyone else does? Um, this is the shape of our packs. Um, so when you're getting our seeds, you get artwork that you can keep as well as your seeds inside. And so this is the nasturtium that I did eventually find. Um, and this was one of the first works that we commissioned by a silhouette artist. Uh, she can look at your profile and freehand cut your silhouette out of a piece of paper. She's phenomenal. And she basically did that with the nasturtium. And she said, I should never tell anyone this, and I tell everyone all the time. Um, what she used for the paper was she had an old copy and a sort of ratty um, book cover to One Straw Revolution which is a really seminal, important book in terms of thinking about uh, community-supported uh, agriculture and s on smaller farms and how smaller farms can feed our communities. Um, and she used the cover, so there was this great book connection with that, too. Some of our artists take things a little bit more literally um, and actually do do an illustration of the variety. This is uh, at Molly's Ground Cherry, which you should all be very familiar with from Seed Savers Exchange. Um, and I always encourage my artists, though, to not think about creating the perfect illustration of something, but instead to think about what does this plant really look like. Um, all of our gardens, it's almost never that our gardens look like that perfect photograph on the seed pack. 
<laughs> at least not my garden. Maybe you all have these perfect gardens out there, but there are yellowing leaves. There are holes in the leaves. There are parts of the plants that die. There are years when things look good, and there are years when things don't look so good, all depending. And I w always am encouraging, again, this idea of thinking about growing the story. When you think about growing the story, you're not trying to attain this idea of the perfect plant, the perfect garden. Instead, you're thinking, this is my story. I'm contributing to this story in some way. There's going to be some tragedy. There's going to be some heartache. There's going to be some deliciousness. It's all going to be part of the story of this year's garden. And so this artist included that, the yellowing leaves. Uh, cosmonaut Volkov Tomato. Uh, <laughs> This artist is a graphic novel um, illustrator, and so he really went with the story and telling the different parts of this story. Uh, Tiger Paw Aster, this artist went more with the name um, and including the tiger there. She's actually a potter. Uh, the top one here is uh, evergreen bunching onions, and the bottom one is Nigella, uh, uh, also called Love in a Mist. And those are the packs for those. Um, this was for, <laughs> for Muncher Cucumber. And there's, there's a reason that I have a whole process that I go through with artists. Uh, this year, about 200 artists applied. We only had about 20 uh, varieties to work with. So there's a whole selection process. And part of it is doing a proposal. I loved this proposal. Um, Doug, I don't know if Doug's here right now. Oh, Doug's in the back. Um, Doug wasn't so sure this would sell cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to come to a compromise. That's Doug um, sort of uh, physically demonstrating to me why that sketch might not be the best idea for selling cucumbers. Um, so eventually we worked out a different design with the artist where the artist could really preserve his style, anyone looking at this pack who knows David Barubi's art would recognize this as David Barubi's art, even though we had to work out between us something that would also work for um, selling muncher cucumbers. <laughs> zinnias, I'll go through these quickly because I want you all to get to your next things on time. Uh, this is Gift Zinnia, which is a uh, Seed Savers Exchange introduced variety. Lemon Cucumber. Um, I thought this artist did a great job capturing the sort of novelty, oddity of the lemon cucumber. Kohlrabi, again, an odd vegetable and an odd artist. Good <laughs> pair. Uh, moonflower, which is just absolutely beautiful and really, um, we tend to think about it climbing and covering walls. And this is an artist who creates walls. Um, and she created this wall on a smaller version for us with all of the night creatures and night pollinators to represent moonflower. There's, you can see this one in the exhibit upstairs at the barn too, and that's the seed pack. Our kaleidoscope carrot. That's how the seed packs open. Um, they're square when they're closed and the, the flaps unfold like a flower, revealing the seeds inside. And this is one of our gallery shows. Um, and this is a whole part of doing the artwork and including the artwork that I wouldn't have predicted, but it's really been wonderful for us, is the artwork really has opened doors for us as a seed company and a, as a seed library in ways that if I was just talking about seeds um, and just thinking about what the plants look like in terms of photographically, I don't think we'd be engaging the diversity of people that are have been coming to our gallery shows um, and who are interested in our seeds. So this is a gallery show, uh, f actually a few different gallery shows. Heart Seed, um, that's the artist who created that. She actually made an apron, a linen apron that's hand embroidered for Heart Seed balloon vine. This is uh, two people uh, comparing the pack with the original. People really love to see the original work and understand how that translated into the pack. Um, the Three people below, two of them. One is an urban uh, farmer uh, in Brooklyn, uh, and the other is Lorna Sass, who is a cookbook author. And at our openings, we're finding we have farmers, we have artists, we have people who love art, we have eaters, we have activists. Um, we have all of these different parts of what, when I think about sustainable agriculture, it's not just thinking about farmers and not just thinking about the people who are buying food, but it's thinking about who's growing the seeds, 
gardeners, people who like to eat, which is most of us, <laughs> um, <laughs> artists, uh, the economy. All of these things are different pieces that I think artists, when they're creating work, and they're borrowing from all these different pieces of culture. And so I've really started to think about artists, our artists especially, as seed savers. Um, in that, as seed savers, we know we're selecting based on our personal likes what and what's important to us, our ideas of beauty and flavor, um, and what we want to pass on. Artists are doing the same thing, but, but the kernels that they're thinking about and the characteristics that they're thinking about are cultural. What are the things that they feel are important to preserve and to pass on? And what stories do they want to tell? So this is, again, um, uh, Giuseppe Arcimboldo, uh, 16th century. And this is a sketch proposal for one of the new PACs um, uh, artists who's doing our cut flower mix. Um, these are sneak peeks, by the way. Don't, don't take pictures of this, put it on your Facebook page. I'll be <laughs> really mad. This is under, this is just between us. Um, so uh, we're hopefully, depending on the how the crop comes in, um, going to be uh, sharing with everyone a, a black edamame. Black, uh, it's called Black Panther. It's a great edamame variety. Um, this is Ulster Germade, um, the bottom picture, which is a local tomato, came from a local family, was donated to us. And I love that this artist decided to go with actually the act, the physical act of seed saving and how important that interaction between the vegetable and, and hands are in that process. So I'm excited about that new pack. Um, and so that, that's a close-up of the embroidery on the apron, heart seed. I think we're all here because we love seeds. And to be here and surrounded by all of these other people who love and care about seeds as much as I do is, is very inspiring for me. Um, and we hold workshops on the farm. This is a workshop we were doing where we were saving ground cherry um, seeds. Uh, everything we do is by hand. We don't have uh, equipment for processing or packing or anything like that. That's a photo of, of seeds being stored in, the, in our seed library. Um, people are an incredibly important part of seeds. We are intertwined, we are interdependent, and I hope that one of the things that you'll discover here and as you go on is finding your own seed stories and thinking about what your seed stories are and how you want to pass them on to other people. And uh, I hope you get a chance to go upstairs and look at some of the artwork. And uh, I'll be, there's also a panel that I'll be on here where we'll talk about all the different ways that communities are saving seeds uh, on a more regional and small scale basis. And I think it's time for everyone to get to their next, yeah? All right. Thanks a lot.